Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. If you're enjoying these podcasts so far, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're listening on and leave me a rating and review. This is really helpful and allows me to keep producing good content by drawing more of the top names in the industry to the show. Also sign up for our newsletters on our website at www.kisorganics.com. I send out a newsletter approximately every two weeks, and this is the best way to ensure you know when the next podcast has been released. They also have the latest discounts, new product information, blog posts, and what's happening in the industry. Our guest this week is Suzanne Wainwright Evans. She is an ornamental entomologist specializing in integrated pest management. Suzanne has been involved in the green industry for more than 25 years with a primary focus on biological control and using pesticides properly. She is a graduate of the University of Florida with degrees in both entomology and environmental horticulture. She has worked throughout the United States and internationally consulting to greenhouses, nurseries, landscapers, and interior scape companies. Additionally, Suzanne is frequently published in trade magazines and teaches her workshops and lectures professionally to industry groups. Her lecturers use an extensive libraries of insect photos and macro insect movies. That's actually how I met Suzanne. She really stole the show with her presentation, and I consider it a huge honor that she was willing to come on the podcast. She has also spoken at the Smithsonian Institute, as well as appeared on Growing a Greener World on PBS. She is the owner of Bug Lady Consulting, now in business for over 16 years. Suzanne lives in Pennsylvania with her husband one dog and eight cats in a log home built in the 1820s, which is where I caught up with her for this interview. Now, if you are a large scale commercial cultivator and are serious about consulting or setting up an IPM program utilizing beneficial insects, I can't recommend her enough. Her website is www.bugladyconsulting.com. On the other hand though, if you're just looking to get a few questions answered or have a small medical grow and no budget for actual consulting, please try and attend one of her upcoming talks rather than emailing her. She is a very generous person with her time and wants to be able to help everyone, but her consulting schedule is very full and is, this is her livelihood. I assured her that she would not be bombarded by emails after this show as she is an incredibly busy person already. She has a ton of information including her upcoming events, articles she's written, and much more on her website. Please do check it out. Now before we dive into this week's podcast, I wanted to give listeners a bit of background. I purposely kept the questions as general as possible because as you will soon learn, with biological controls, it's not as simple as this bug eats that bug. There's a lot of other information you need to know starting with proper identification and then looking at the growing environment to determine what biocontrols would be most effective. It's really important to get an expert with a background in entomology to properly utilize these beneficial and predatory insects. Now let's get on with the show. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking some time today to chat with me. I really appreciate it. And we are here with Suzanne Wainwright Evans, also known as the Bug Lady. And Suzanne, can you give me a little bit of a background into how you got into into this industry and, and why bugs are so fascinating to you? Well, first, thanks for having me. And it was really great to meet you in person uh, the other week. Um, you were very impressive, so I agreed to do this because I really appreciate you wanting to get good scientific information out there and getting good information to growers so that they can manage their uh, pest issues. But um, my background, I decided in middle school I wanted to be an entomologist, and um, that was basically the path I set myself on, self on. And I went to the University of Florida, where I have degrees in entomology and environmental horticulture. And while I was in college, I worked in the horticulture slash agriculture industry, doing many different jobs. So I've been in the industry over 25 years. And for the last 16 years, I've worked for myself as an independent insect consultant, uh, where I don't sell, I do not sell biocontrol agents, I don't sell pesticides. My job is basically to help growers put together good pest management programs, but a little bit more focused on the biocontrol uh, options, but I do have to understand pesticides and how they work and compatibility with biocontrol agents because sometimes we don't have biocontrol agents uh, for some of our pest issues. 
So you do work within the cannabis industry. I know you've given talks at Canacon, and then I just most recently heard you at a, another conference. And beyond that, though, you do a lot of work outside of the cannabis industry with the ornamental, uh, with ornamental crops and things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about the sorts of work that you do? Yeah, um, I work in. Um, I, I would. I generally what I say is I work in everything, but like soybeans and corn and big outdoor ag. Um, I have customers that are aquaponics producers where they're growing fish and they're growing lettuce. Um, I also work with some of the theme parks dealing with insect pests in their landscape where they're open for the majority of the day and they can't afford or they can't afford the time to come in and spray or there's the public perception of seeing people in spray suits. Um, I work with uh, large ornamental growers. Um, I, one of my growers, they produce uh, 4 million poinsettias a year and do a million hanging baskets. So some large scale operations all the way down to some uh, smaller greenhouses that specialize maybe in edible flowers or other specialty crops. I like to work with challenging situations and usually people end up at me when they've tried everything else and are just kind of struggling with controlling pests and so they hire me to come in and basically figure out what's going on and and come up with a strategy on how to manage pests um, again with a bit more of a focus on on biocontrol options great now one thing I want to emphasize is that we talked a little bit off off air before this and you had mentioned you'd only been home for I think four weeks so far this year you're obviously really busy and your plate is full with consulting as it stands now if you're listening to this podcast and you are a large scale commercial grower or cultivator and you need to bring someone in to help you, you would be able to potentially provide consulting for that, but you probably don't have time for one or two emails from that guy with three plants or five plants or a small grow. So what kind of resources would you recommend for someone like that starting out who wants to consider using beneficial insects and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, necessarily fit into your consulting schedule? It's challenging because um, even some of the small growers, um, you know, small CSAs that are maybe just like an acre or so have the same kind of challenges um, of how do you get current viable information f for their business when most most publications, um, you know, they're, they're targeting large scale commercial ag and that's where a lot of the research is done. And it, it's a real challenge. You know, I think sometimes, you know, having a network of other growers to reach out to is really important. But unfortunately, what I've seen within the cannabis industries is there's some bad information and it just keeps getting perpetuated and perpetuated with the, the cut and paste uh, ability of the internet and even on some of the Facebook pages where people are posting insects for identification, it, it, you have people, and I, I say this as nice as you can, who are just not qualified to being able to identify insects. And I see people when they say, they're, they're guessing, but they say it like it's fact. And growers are getting bad information and misidentification. With being cannabis, you know, you don't have the options of reaching out to extension uh, with, where other people can, but you can, you know, if you do have an insect pest, you can put the insect just in alcohol. And as long as it's not on the plant material, you could get uh, someone to identify it for you through extension. Just don't mention host plant. Um, because once they find out what the host plant is, you know, they're not going to be able to help you because of all the, the, the money and I, everybody knows the issue there. I don't have to go over that. But th there are going to be some more resources coming. Um, I'm seeing more of the traditional um, trade journals and magazines that have focused on ornamental and vegetable greenhouse production um, become more involved in the cannabis industry. I was actually contacted this week by one of the trade publications that are interested in doing, um, they want to talk to me about doing an e-publication on pest management for specifically for cannabis because cannabis has 
its own set of challenges that some of the other industries don't have. But, you know, they have different challenges that, you know, the, the cannabis people don't have. But, I mean, as I've looked around, resources are pretty limited. There are some books um, available, but I tell you, I, I've read through some of them, and it, it just, it, there's just some of the information's good, but there's also bad information in there. And it's really hard for me once I look at a resource that I know has bad information, how am I to trust anything else that resource says? So it, it, it's, it's, it's a real challenge right now for small cannabis growers to get good, viable information. Um, I think that uh, some of the educational conferences might provide some of that opportunity. But again, you have to look at who's speaking, what their background is to qualify them to be speaking. And I've attended some sessions uh, for people that are quote unquote cannabis pest management experts. And again, I've seen bad information given out there. So, I, you know, I wish I had a better answer, but it, it's, it's a real challenge. So it sounds like starting with an extension service or university is a good option. One thing you brought up with consultants is is a good point that anyone can be a consultant if they want to slap that title behind their name. And there's no requirements uh, for that. One of the challenges also with that is that these consultants, while they may, may have a good list of customers or clients that they're working with, that doesn't necessarily mean that what they're doing is optimal or the most successful option there. So I guess that, that leads me to uh, where where do you like people to start? So if when you walk into a new facility or a new situation, what is the, the first thing you're looking at? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess identification. Is that where you like to always start when it comes to these bug problems or... Yeah, we have to know what you're dealing with. And again, insect ID is really critical. And I see a lot of guessing and a lot of assumptions. Um, and, you know, some insects are easier to identify than others, but some can be extremely challenging. Um, thrips is a good example. And trying to identify immature thrips is is it will melt your brain. It is so hard. You really need to be able to see adults. And ideally, you do have to slide mount them. You have to spread their wings. So when somebody posts a picture online of an immature thrips and everybody's like, oh, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. You know, I went to college for seven years for this. And I've been doing this for 25 years. And I don't know. So I don't know how all these people magically <laughs> know. So... And, and, and that's what happens is, is, you know, people have gotten bad identifications and pest management options have not worked. So when I do go in, we spend quite a bit of time on identifying what the problem is. I also want to know what you've been doing as far as what you've tried. And, you know, if, if something should have worked and didn't work, you know, we spend a fair amount of time on troubleshooting. So you had this problem, this should have controlled it, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Just saying it didn't work is not good enough for me. I want to get in there and find out what went wrong so that we can correct the problem and either not do that again or correct it so it, it does work because sometimes it can be applicator error, you know, whether it be bios or spray products. It can be the rates were wrong you know, environmental conditions. I mean, there, there is a whole list of things that can go wrong when you're trying to treat for uh, uh, pest, pest issues. Um, and so figuring out how we got there is, is really critical uh, when I get into a facility. That's a really good point. Uh, one other thing, because these are live you know, living organisms, there's a chance they could be coming in stressed as well or dead. And one of the things you talked about was identification of the quality of the the bugs that you're producing, you're you're buying or purchasing, and making sure that they're arriving in a state where they're going to want to eat whatever pest problem you're dealing with. Correct? Yes. Um, in fact, I've taught some uh, workshops with some I will call them coworkers, but they're not. They don't work for me, but they're industry people that I trust. Um, we've taught a couple times now around the country um, how to assess the quality of your biocontrol agents. 
again, being a grower, you know, and what you have available equipment wise and testing wise, you know, it is kind of limited, but there are some, you know, quick down and dirty things that growers can do just to double check. That said, you know, being in this industry for many, many years now, the quality has greatly improved. We know so much more now than we even did know five years ago. It, it, it's constantly evolving, getting better at shipping, better at ventilation on packaging. But one of the most critical things, and anybody that knows me knows this, I think it is so important for your biocontrol agents to be shipped to you directly from the insectary. If distributors want to sell product, that's fine, but I don't like when product goes from an insectary to a distributor, they repackage or they stick their label on it and they reship out because that adds extra shipping time. Also, it's more time for the temperature to fluctuate within, uh, within um, you know, the, the, the shipping process where you want to keep those biocontrol agents at their consistent temperature basically and until you're going to warm them up and to be ready to use them. So um, I have seen situations with product uh, that have been sold through distributors, not drop shipped, but um, through, uh, you know, distributors where the product has not been so good. I've also seen emails saying, hey, we've got extra product this week and offering it a discount. But, you know, when those insects are stressed or dead or been cannibalized, it's not going to do you a, a lot of good. You know, so I think it's really important to get from a good quality supplier. And it, it can be challenging because from, you know, being in grows and stuff, you know, a lot of people just like to go online, order stuff and pay through it through PayPal. But the key insectaries that sell to the U.S., you just can't go order on their website and pay with PayPal. They're more set up in a traditional purchasing system where you need to contact the insectary and set up an account with them, um, which they do take credit cards. But, you know, I think that you're just you're going to get a better quality product. You're going to get better information. Now, it can be challenging if you are a hobbyist growers because you typically need much smaller amounts, and some of the insectaries do have minimum orders, and that may be a situation where you may have to use a distributor, but you've just got to stay on top and making sure that product is, is a quality product before you go out. Because, again, there's no point in spending the money and then the time of putting it out if, if they're not going to do what they need to do. So if you were a, a, let's just say hobby grower, that's a good term for that, where would you start not knowing as much about you know insects as you do? Is there a company out there that they could potentially call up and place a smaller order if they can't go directly to an insectary? And then on the same note, if I was a larger facility, a commercial grower, and got a recommendation from you or someone else that's knowledgeable, would I want to set up an account directly with an insectary? So um, one thing about the cannabis industry is I have to say you guys are pretty tight knit um, and you guys visit each other's grows, uh, which we can talk about that later. Yes. But um, and, and back in the early days, like, you know, 20 years ago, um, when I, back then I actually did sell biocontrol agents before we learned I'm a terrible sale, salesperson. Um, but what some of my uh, greenhouse people would do down in Florida is to help save on shipping is they'd pull their order all together and they would come to one facility and then people would just drive over, pick their stuff up and take it back. And so if you guys do, you know, you have your friends around that, you know, also grow, you talk to each other, you know, they could, you guys could pull your order together and then you'd be able to meet some of these minimum orders from insectaries and be able to just do it that way um, is, is one option. The other thing is, and I don't know the exact minimum orders for all the insectaries, but I do think um, beneficial insectary, um, I don't think their minimum order is too high. But remember, you are going to be paying overnight freight on this on these biocontrol agents. And it's very frustrating to people when they're spending – forty dollars on on bugs but then you know fifty dollars on shipping so you do have to look at the price of shipping as part of 
the biocontrol agents. And of course, your pricing on shipping is going to depend on where you're located and, you know, how much you're actually getting and things like that. But sometimes, whether you buy one bottle or six bottles, your shipping might be the same because, you know, there's that basically the way they're doing more shipping today, it's based on, you know, the size of the box. And so oftentimes what I'll tell my growers to do too is talk to them. And if, you know, you're ordering two bottles of Persimilis, you know, ask them how much it is to just go ahead and fill out the rest of that box because putting out extra is not necessarily going to hurt anything and, and just spending a little more money to get things super duper cleaned up might be worth the time because you're paying the shipping anyhow on that. But the best thing to do is is look at your needs, contact an insectary and see what their minimum order is for where you are and see if, if they can do that. But if not, there are smaller distributors that will break down these larger orders for you. But again, you do sometimes can run the risk of the product being a day or two older. Some things can handle it. If they've got a food source, you know, they, they tend to do okay. Things like sachets can handle it. But when you get into some of the predatory mites that don't have food, it can, it, it can impact the quality of the product. And especially, again, if you get that warming and cooling and any condensation in the bottle, that can really be an issue. Now, I realize we just kind of dove right in without ever talking about exactly why this is so important. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I think a lot of our listeners are pretty savvy, but why are, why are we really using uh, biocontrols? Why is, why is this industry so important in such a solution? Because I know for me, when I first found out about people using beneficial insects, I was, I was initially pretty skeptical of it. And to me, I didn't realize how much there was to know. I guess I started out thinking, okay, you have this bug. I'm dealing with two spot mites. Well, I get this is the solution and not realizing that there were all these other factors like lighting, and humidity and temperature and, and, and so much more that went into uh, choosing the right beneficial insect to deal with the right pest to make sure it was successful. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there buying the wrong insects for the wrong pest and wasting a lot of money. So, yeah, do you want to touch on that just a little bit? So... And I'm going to talk about, let's talk about overall agriculture as a whole, because I mean, cannabis now is part of agriculture. The number one driving force behind the use of biocontrol agents is because people cannot manage their pests with spray products anymore. Their resistance to chemical pesticides is a very big factor. It's just like how people have... Uh, taken overtaken uh, taken too many antibiotics and so now a lot of uh, the diseases that humans get are resistant to antibiotics the exact same thing has happened with a lot of these key pests like aphids and thrips and two spot spider mites they've had so much exposure to chemicals they're they're not a lot of people say oh they mutate it's not that it, it's it's they're selecting for insects and mites that are able basically to metabolize the pesticide and it doesn't kill them. Or people use what is called a sublethal dose where they, the pests are exposed to lower doses of a product and it doesn't kill them, but it allows them to build up resistance to it. And that's why it's very dangerous when people are like, well, I don't really want to spray chemicals, so I'm just going to, you know, use a real low rate below what's on the label because that really contributes to uh, uh, having the pests resistant to these chemistries. And what has happened, again, you know, two-spotted spider mites, white flies, western flower thrips, aphids. I mean, you look at two-spotted spider mites, they're resistant to 95 different chemistries now because of exposure to chemical pesticides. So this has been overall in agriculture, the driving force is because they can't management, manage them. I, I don't get calls from growers saying, well, I care about the drinking water and I care about, no, it's Oh my gosh, I can't just I can't control these pests. We have to do something. And so that's really is what has gotten the ball rolling. Now, 
what has happened too is is there are things called MRLs. Those are maximum residue levels. And that's what they're looking at with produce now where, okay, yes, this chemical is legal to spray on this, this vegetable, but you can only have so much of that chemical on it. So you can't just spray that chemical over and over and over again, um, even though it's legal to be applied there. So people are looking to break up their spray programs by using these biocontrol agents so they don't spray as much. Now, the cannabis industry can be like, well, hey, you know, we haven't been using these pesticides. And so, you know, our pest problems shouldn't be resistant. First of all, come on, you guys all know the chemicals you guys have been spraying and it's pretty hard i hear you laughing because you know what i'm talking about <laughs> i do i mean i do when growers would contact me 10 years ago you know and hey i'm growing tomatoes i've got spider mites you know it, 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 then there was no concern for human safety and i don't think it was out of maliciousness it was out of just ignorance of not understanding you know combustion of pesticides, con concentrations of pesticides into oils off of plants, and the impacts. Now there's actually regulatory rules um, by the states for which chemicals you can use. And so, okay, fine. You know, we're, we're not using Avid. We're not using Fluoromite. The problem is, is what is the rest of the agricultural community uh, using? Uh, you know, if, if the the ornamental guy down the way is doing a rotation of spider of, of avid and fluoromite and hexagon and ovation, and he develops resistance. If those two spot spider mites do get into your grow, they already have that resistance. So even though you may have not have used those chemicals, you have a resistant population. And that's how we, um, have had a major problem controlling um, uh, this particular whitefly species in the United States. Believe it or not, it, the problem actually originated in Spain, and they overused chemistries there to the, where the whiteflies were resistant, and that population of whiteflies got into the United States and has spread. So even though you may not be spraying the chemicals, the pest popula population you have may have been exposed to it through multiple generations, and so they can be resistant. Just to state the obvious here, I, I assume you're getting good results when people are following a proper biocontrol program. You're able to control or eradicate some of these pest problems. Okay, first of all, destroy the word eradicate from your vocabulary. There is no such thing. Uh, even, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, the chemical guys would talk about eradicating pests. Now when they talk about pest management, they talk about suppressing it, being below an economic threshold, because you're not going to be able to eradicate it. It's, it's growing a plant that's pretty darn clean, and you know, you're not seeing pest issues, and you're not seeing damage, because eradication, is just, it just does not happen anymore. So if we had two spotted mites, or thrips, or brood aphids, whatever pest in, in a in an indoor facility, let's say, so a, a more controlled environment, we should assume that those will always be there for the life of the facility or, you know, for multiple crops? It's very possible, you know, especially if you, you know, have any kind of hydroponic system set up, if you're using any kind of NFT or where your ebb and flood benches, especially root aphids, you're just going to spread them and spread them and spread them. All it takes is one being left behind. And for the cannabis industry, they don't have some of the, I will air quote, stronger chemistries that can really knock back a pest issue. They, you guys just don't have it as an option. Your best thing to do is not get the problem. But to be honest, I think the cat's out of the bag on that. I mean, they've just spread all their problems far and wide between everybody at this point. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So some of the things that we're seeing are uh, a lot of problems with people sharing sharing clones or spreading you know spreading pests back and forth what sorts of things do you recommend just you know basic common sense things that you think every grower should be doing when it comes to getting in new genetics or even just basic biocontrols um, around the around the facility well every time you bring new plant material into a facility, you, it, it is a gamble. And 
we're still trying to wrap our hands around exactly all the pest problems you potentially could have. It, it seems like, you know, new, new pests are popping up that, you know, it's not that you can't say, well, we didn't think it'd be on cannabis. You just didn't think about it being on cannabis. And it's turning out to be cannabis is a pretty good host for a lot of uh, a lot of problems. And now that we're seeing more industrial hemp being grown outside, we're really learning more about which pests attack it, um, which are a lot of your common agricultural pests. They're moving right over from, you know, vegetable and grain production right into uh, uh, cannabis stuff. But you know, if, if if you can not bring stuff in, which I know is because you need to get new genetics, you know, that that's how people are getting problems. These hemp russet mites are not a government conspiracy that the government is <laughs> breeding and blowing at you're laughing again, but I know people believe that. It's not part of a, a weed biocontrol program. It's a different speed it's 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 not even mite that's close to the hemp russet mite. You get hemp russet mite because somebody brought it in on a plant on plant material or their clothing, and it's kind of been a little self it's self done. So, if I were to build my ideal greenhouse today, I would definitely have a, a quarantine facility where you would hold all new plant material um, just to make sure that it's not coming in with any pests. I also think that dipping cuttings is going to be the best way to stop new new things from coming in. The ornamental industry is really starting to embrace this technology of dipping cuttings um, because then you get 100% coverage. Um, I'm not going to say you're going to eradicate every single pest on there 100%, but you can get pretty significant knockback. Um, it, it's a practice that even people that have their own stock mother plants in their facility are when they take those cuttings, they're dipping them before they stick them, even even in house stuff, just to stop that constant cycle of of these pests. So you know, having quarantine facility, keeping things isolated, dipping cuttings, and just it's all about sanitation practices, and 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 you know, it just cannabis people just need to learn more about sanitation. If you get an opportunity to uh, ever, I, I recommend for cannabis people, go tour some of the ornamental uh, production facilities that are doing things like geraniums. Like, y you can't just go in and touch plants with your bare hands. You have sanitation. You got to wash your hands. You have to, you know, use alcohol, things like that to make sure you're not spreading any pathogens. And uh, granted, not all ornamental facilities have quarantines and, and do all the right stuff, but they have more options to clean their products up and their pests they're dealing with may not completely destroy their crop. And the cannabis crop value is much higher per plant than ornamentals. You know, it's, it's just you can afford to throw away, you know, 10 pansy plants and it's no big deal. You can't afford to do that in, in a cannabis uh, facility. Um, also, uh, human transmission, I think, is, is really uh, something that needs to be looked at because most people that work at a facility grow at home, and it's very easy to transport those pests back and forth. When you go to a grow facility or you have guests visiting, you know, have they been at any other grows that day? Because if they were in an infested grow, they swipe their sleeve up against a plant, can pick up pests. There is potential for them that it possible if they brush up against another plant, you know, they, they could spread it, um, spread uh, insects and mites that way. Chance of it happening, I don't think anybody's looked at the, you know, the exact risk of that, but it, it could definitely happen. And so protocols of, you know, Tyvek suits, you know, lab coats, hand washing stations, all that stuff I think is so critical. Um, and I just don't see those kinds of things at the, the cannabis facilities being implemented. So in your ideal facility, you'd have no one doing home grows. And I assume no one going from another grow back to your 
greenhouse, they would have to go home, shower, change clothes, or uh, address that. Would you have foot baths in place? Do you think those are useful? It depends on how you're growing. You know, places that have cement floors. I, I was at a place this last week. You could have eaten off their floors. They were so meticulous. And the chances of a pathogen being able to survive in those kind of environments, and again, it depends on the pathogen, are much slimmer than those that have little dirt piles and or on gravel or outdoor production facilities. But I will say, you know, I'm not a pathologist. That's, you know, the disease person department to, to, to look at what the risk is for disease transmission where I'm more dealing with insect issues. Um, I also, you know, the, the tobacco mosaic virus, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, I plant, you know, you can see some of the, the, the symptoms in the plant, but I'm still getting uh, my same amount of harvest, I think is a very risky uh, uh, attitude to have. Because then if you are taking cuttings off of those plants and then repropagating, you know, we don't want to be spreading a virus, you know, through through all the plants out there. And I don't know really if there's been enough looked at the long term impact of this virus on cannabis. And what if you have a secondary problem that those two problems then could completely stress the plant out? So smoking is something that, you know, has to be looked at because, um, you know, do some reading on tobacco mosaic virus. Again, not exactly my department because it's mechanically transmitted by hands and cigarettes and all that. But, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a risk. Um, you need to look at, you know, most vegetable production facilities do not allow their employees to smoke because of potential virus transmission from cigarettes. Have you actually seen uh, lab results showing tobacco mosaic virus in cannabis? And then have you heard of it being transferred from cigarettes? Okay, so I have seen pictures of the plants that they, and I did not physically see the actual report. I'm going on them saying that the report came back positive for it. So in that situation, because, you know, I can't be all places at all times. And, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania where cannabis is just starting um, over here. But um, you can get those ELISA test kits, uh, like from Agdia, that you can do that quick first initial virus testing in-house to see if you do get a positive before paying to send it off for further virus testing. It, it, it's just a quick way to make sure, oh, you know, because it could be nutritional, it could be cultural, there could be other things. So at least it's a quick way to do that. And I've talked to other people um, in the cannabis industry, and I will say they seem to know what they're talking about, that this is a concern for them. And it will be interesting to see uh, what happens with uh, more of the hemp being grown outdoors. Um, in traditional tobacco states to see if, you know, it becomes an issue for um, outdoor production as well on that. So it's just something to keep an eye out for. Again, we don't have the answers for everything because this is such a new, new developing industry and there just hasn't been a lot of research on it yet. But it does from the report. And again, once you get into virology testing and stuff, you know, you can get a positive for one virus when it can be another virus. It gets very complicated. But I, I do think it's something we need to watch for. And again, it's all part of sanitation. One thing you touched on is that uh, these these pests seem to be opportunistic, like they prefer, you mentioned plant stress being a factor. Uh, how much of a factor is plant stress in terms of a lot of these pests? Well, when you say stress, um, I, I, you know, there, there's this race to push the plants. And again, this is not, this is just not cannabis. This is ornamentals. They push the plants, want them to grow fast. They want them to be dark green. You want nice big blooms or buds on anything. But there is a lot of supportive research now on ornamental and vegetable crops that when you push these plants to grow, and the plants are actually growing at a faster rate. The plants can't de 
can't produce a lot of their natural defensive chemicals and, uh, you know, the plant's de natural defense is chemicals that includes, you know, caffeine, nicotine, things like that. Those are built-in insecticides, pyrethrins. But if you're busy growing, you can't produce as many chemicals and you become more susceptible. They've done work looking at roses and chrysanthemums, and they've actually found by reducing uh, parts per million of nitrogen, it can have significant impact on spider mite population and Western flower thrips population. So this is something in ornamentals that we're trying to do. You know, we're still, we have to grow on a schedule because you got to get those plants out for Mother's Day. You got to have the poinsettias out in time for Christmas sales and all that. But we're looking at, can we lower nitrogen levels to where we can help suppress some of these plants, you know, some of the pest pressures, but still grow a healthy quality plant. And so with cannabis, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, more is not better, but it seems to be the motto of this industry of just dumping every, it's a lot of different stuff on the plants. But I do think this is something that needs to be looked at is, you know, if we can adjust fertilization to where we can still get your same amount of harvest, but reduce your pest pressures. And it takes research and it takes someone willing to do the research. And unfortunately, that's still not going to be done on a government university extension level. It takes a growing facility that's willing to take the time to do that and to understand research and how to do it. So this is a question I'm really curious about. I hear a lot of people correlating BRICS levels with pest resistance. Do you have any information on that in terms of the, the sugar content in the leaf somehow making a plant less interesting to a particular pest? Well, uh, I don't have too much comment on it because usually, you know, when you're talking about brick stuff, you're usually you're talking about fruit production because they're trying to look at the sugars that way. But there was an interesting study done, University of Maryland, and I believe it was Dr. Mike Rupp. I'd have to go back and look. But they were looking at brown marmorated stink bug, which, you know, we're seeing um, in uh, uh, cannabis hanging out and uh, feeding on the plant. They looked on trees, ornamental trees in the landscape where the brown marmorated stink bugs were feeding. And there, there's this, and it's, you know, I don't want this job, but somebody does this job where they actually can, when an insect is feeding, you can almost, you can basically cut off their mouth parts and then it works basically as a needle. And so then you can collect from the end of the broken off mouth part where exactly the insect was feeding. They do this like with aphids to see what they're feeding on, what part of the plant, and the sugar content. And they found that brown marmoted stink bug knew exactly on trees where to tap into higher sugar levels. And so them in the plants, and that's what they head for, because sugar content in a plant is not evenly distributed. Um, and so it's something that's starting to be looked at, but I I. I I don't have an exact scientific answer with it. it. It may be anecdotal. There may be something to it. But if, you know, you're pushing one plant to do one thing, then it typically can't do another thing. You can, you can only do so much at once. Well, it does appear that when you have a, a room of plants, the most stressed plant will be the first one that you'll see pests on, in, in my unless, experience. Unless you have a very susceptible cultivar. Yes, and that's the thing, too. And I think it's really, really, really critical for the cannabis industry to be tracking, okay, we're growing the, these, these 10 cultivars, but, you know, number nine always seems to be the first with a spider mite outbreak. That needs to be noted, and people need to be sharing that information so that even though, you know, maybe it has some other great qualities, you know, selecting for cultivars that have more resistance issue, resistance, um, uh, resist issues is the right word, but resistance to them so that maybe you may give up some other little quality, but selecting for plants that don't have pest issues. Um, saw that in chrysanthemum production, there's a variety called Viron that is a, you want Western flower thrips? You grow that variety, and most commercial growers do not grow it anymore because it is so prone to Western flower thrips, even though it has a nice flower to it. And what ended up happening is people actually use it as a, a, a trap plant where they would put it in the middle of their other mums, and it would actually draw the Western flower thrips 
right to the Viron, then they would bag the Viron and uh, get rid of the plant, and they would actually pull the pests out that way. But there, there's a definite correlation between stress and cultivar deciding on, okay, who's going to get fed on and who's not going to get fed on. Have you seen, well, I want to come back to the indicator trap plant and pollinator plants, but before we do, I just want to touch on other things like, uh, I've heard there were some studies, I've read some studies on seaweed helping with uh, insect resistance. Have you done any research or read anything on that? I mean, I know that, I mean, so, you know, seaweeds have cytokinins in them. And that, from what I've seen in personal experiences, it does definitely help with overall plant growth. I've not seen, and, and this is also where when you look at research, you have to specifically look at how the research was done and who did the research and where was it published and is it peer reviewed? Because, you know, you've got the whole thing today of, you know, pay to publish and you could have some really bad science, but you can pay a journal to publish it for you. And that doesn't mean it's actually good sound science. And so that's why you got to be very careful with reading some of the stuff and and the sources and also look how the experiments are done one, one example of you know people were looking at silicon because there was like oh you use silicon it thickens the cuticle and then you don't have as many pest issues well there was some initial work done where they put silicone on plants and then they looked at mealybugs on them but they saw no difference well, the problem was, is the crop they were using was not a silicone accumulator. And you see this, that just because you use something on one plant doesn't mean you're going to get the same results on another plant because plants are picky about what nutrients they're going to uptake and in what form and in what quantities. And, you know, this is where maybe seaweed may work in some situations and some, even some medias, but may not in another. Also, You've got to have a control when you do the test to make sure that it's something not environmental or something else that's causing the results that you think you're seeing. That's a really good point. I'll have to go back and look. It was a book called uh, Seaweed and Plant Growth by T.L. Sen, which was a collection of research articles that he sort of uh, he sort of went over. And I, I remember reading about it, but I'll, I'll have to go back and look. And you do bring up a really good point that we try and emphasize in just about every podcast that people do need to have a control they need need to look at an actual study and see how it was um, how it was established and how it was set up and make sure the methodology methodology fits with uh, what they're looking to draw from it so those are all really good points moving on though I would love to ask you this is one that I know <clears throat> we talked about a little bit when we met was about neem and neem oil and how you mentioned it was not your favorite can you touch a little bit on that Sure. I, I'm not saying neem oil is bad. Let me put that out there because I don't want to get all these, you know, hate emails, <laughs> you know. But from my personal experience doing, you know, what I do, first of all, oils are not oils are not oils are not oils. You know, there's a reason you cook with Wesson oil. There's a reason we use, you know, different kinds of oils for, you know, makeup. And there's different kinds of oils than that we use for pest management. There's particle size difference. They, some of them, um, you know, are, are mix better into water than others. You know, there's some that do better in certain, you know, spray equipment that don't cause clogging. The thing with neem oil is people are like, oh, you know, it's from a plant. So, you know, we're crunchy granolas. That's great. I hate the petroleum industry, so I don't want to use petroleum-based products. Well, if you hate petroleum-based products, you better stop driving your car and, you know, heating your house and, you know, drinking out of that plastic cup. Unfortunately, you know, petroleum is part of our lives. I, I would, it'd be great if it wasn't the way it is, but that's the reality. Just because something is a plant-based product does not mean it is always safe for humans, always safe for the environment. You know, that's, that's a, a big misconception um, that people, you know, think that just because it's, it's plant-based, it's safe. Now, I'm not saying neem is not safe, but neem is a product that is regulated by our government um, and it has to be registered, you know, and have an EPA registration number on the product because of its insecticidal properties. 
where my concern comes in is we know neem is a good repellent. Um, there's some good research out of Purdue looking at neem as a repellent for like Japanese beetles, where they spray a plant with neem, they have another plant they haven't sprayed with neem, and sure enough, the Japanese beetles tend to pass up a bit more the plant with the neem on it because it has a repelling quality. So if you spray that on a plant, and you want to release biocontrol agents. And again, you've got to look at each individual biocontrol agent. You can't say it with a broad sweeping blanket, but there's a chance you can repel your beneficials off the plants. I've seen biocontrol agents just go to the stems and walk down and march off plants because they don't want to live there. There is some research done where they have sprayed plant material foliage with neem and then put some of the predatory mites on there and the predatory mites choose to leave because of the repelling quality on there. So if you're not going to use biocontrol at all, sure, go for it. But if you think you're going to be using biocontrol agents, you better think about this. Now, if you're growing outside, you know, where you've got overhead irrigation, you know, rain, overhead irrigation, you know, UV light, stuff's going to break down a lot faster, but most people are not growing outside. They're growing, you know, in a, a protected environment where they're not overhead irrigating and, and compounds didn't tend to persist for longer. How long? Don't really know because there hasn't been a ton of work done on this yet, but it is just something if my grower has the option that and they're using bios between using neem or a product like Suff Oil X, you know, I prefer them to use the Suff Oil X because once that's dry, we found that the predatory mites do extremely well on the plants. After that, we don't get that repelling quality uh, w with with the product. And you know, Suff Oil X, so yeah, gotta look at your state and see if it's approved in your state or not. I know it's approved down in uh, like Colorado, but you know, it's an OMRI listed product, so it's approved for use in organic production. It's being used in, in vegetable production, and it's an oil that I very rarely see phytotoxicity with. The other thing, back to neem, neem is not neem is not neem. Um, there's different producers of it. There's different processes. So, you know, you, you really got to, if you're going to pick a product, you really need to learn that product and, and understand it and know how to use it in your growing system. Yeah, I, I've seen huge differences, like over a thousand ppm difference in acid or actin levels across different neem oils. So I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. I didn't realize it was such a repellent. So you mentioned Suffoil X. Well, I looked into this after the first time you mentioned it to me, and it's a tough product for most people to get their hands on unless they are a large scale commercial grower. So your alternative you mentioned was the Monterey Garden Horticultural Oil. Yes. You said it was the same or a similar product. Yes. And that one people should be able to source and find even on Amazon.com. Now, for that, which brings us back to dunking your clones. So I'm going to throw myself under the bus and say when I brought some clones home, they were already in uh, small plants. They were in soil already. So I wanted to treat them because I didn't know if they were if they had something on them. So I dunked them in a five-gallon bucket that I had filled with a neem oil and uh green cleaner combination at 50 50 oh my god well i, I, I want to get your thoughts on this and the the plants uh I, I even dunked the soil the whole thing and the plants took it fine actually they didn't really freak out i didn't put them under a lot of light right after but um what do you recommend well first off i'll let you cover what i did wrong and and why you think this is a terrible idea but then secondly what do you recommend for people that are bringing in plants that are already in soil because most people are not passing clones like they do in the ornamental industry where it's just the leaf tissue it's usually in rock wool or it's in peat uh, or some sort of media already right well i've, I've just Okay, so what is hard is when you have products and you don't have a good dip rate. Because when you look at the research on dips, dip rate is lower typically than spray rate. And until somebody has, you know, figured out what that rate by dipping them in there and growing the plant out and make sure there's no negative impact, you don't necessarily know. And when you are dealing with mixing up just a small quantity of a pesticide, 
a small error can be a big error. And, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to, to go wrong. So uh, there was research done out of Canada looking at dips with Suffoil X. And I will say that for the ornamental market, currently there is not a dip label yet, even though the research has been done. But the spray rate for the Suffoil is typically 1% to 2%, where the dip rate is 0.1%. That's a huge difference from spraying to dipping where they felt they got good enough pest control without causing phyto on a phytotoxicity, you know, damage to the plant. And do keep in mind, you can have phytotoxicity that is not visible to the human eye. It can, plants can be stressed and, can, and it can impact their growth without us actually seeing burning or curling or spots or things like that. <laughs> so that that's there. Now, what I always do when we start talking about dipping is we look at what the plant is and what your target pest is to see what dips are out there for you. I, you do have to be careful with any kind of oil and dipping roots because there is potential for phytotoxicity on the roots. But again, it comes back to product and rates and temperatures. And, you know, is your plant stressed even before you dip? Did you soak it too long? Because it's a dip, it's not a soak. You know, we have to look at all these factors. Um, but for some of the other pests, um, you know, dipping in a botanagard is something that's being done regularly. You can dip in, in soaps. And there are, once you go look at the labels um, and look for the dip rates, you can find these recommended rates. And, and like with the um, botanagard, which again, dip, it, that, that's a whole nightmare because like down in Colorado, you can't use botanagard, but you can do use botanagard max, but you're not going to have a high enough concentration of bavaria spores really to do what you need to do for that. It's, it's getting, unfortunately, very complicated, but just saying that you can mix products for dips. It's best to look at what your target pests are, what your plant is, and try to find the right dip for you. And you may need to do some some testing and, and to grow out plants. And when you do dip, monitor those plants all the way through their life cycle and see if you do notice anything in, in the long run. But dipping is the way that many greenhouse people are stopping pests from getting in the door. I had no idea that the dip rates could vary that much. Um, when I, I did it, I think I used a, the low end of the spray rate and uh, I didn't let it saturate the soil to really get into the root zone. But you know, I didn't know what I was doing either. So uh, I really appreciate that feedback. That's really interesting. So can we talk a little bit about some of the products that you may or may not have experience with? Uh, one of the things that I think is important for people to realize in the industry is that products that aren't EPA regulated, whereas certain, certain ones are like, I'll use neem as an example of that they're claiming to be plant washes or leaf shine products as a way of getting around having to do or not having the ability to get registered with the EPA as a pesticide. Do you have any experience or do you have any thoughts first off on plant wash or plant shine products? And then can we talk a little about some of the products you may have used or, or seen other growers use over the years? It's, it's a gamble, you know, using products that have not been, what I will say is vetted it, it, it is a risk. Um, it's kind of like going down to the farmer's market and buying herbal medicine. And when I say herbal medicine, I'm not talking about cannabis, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, supplements because it's not regulated. So you don't really know what truly you're getting because Basically, you know, you can break things down into, you know, you have your government registered products, which have, will have an EPA registration number, and that will include, again, your neem products, your azadiractin products, your synthetic pesticides, insecticidal microbial products. Then we have what's called the 25B list, and these are products that basically the government said uh, several years ago, okay. We know these products are pretty much food grade. And if you make your pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, miticides, whatever out of them, we are not going to require you to pay the millions of dollars to get them registered. But that doesn't mean the products work. That means you, as a grower, you're just not going to kill yourself or your employees by using these products. Again, it's a lot of food-based products, but there is no 
there's no testing really or no um, vetting through any kind of agency for them. Um, and then there's the, well, we're just going to not make pesticidal claims. We're going to go with, with we're calling it a, a wash kind of thing, which I, you guys all know what's been going on with the plant washes, what they're finding in them, what they're finding in some of these other products. I mean, people are lying and they're adding other pesticides into them to make their products work better. And, and it's a risk. If you are willing to take those risks, and possibly, you know, lose a crop because of pesticide contamination, you know, that's that's a risk some people are, are willing to take. But I don't think they understand that there's on these 25B products, there's no, there's no, not, there's nothing to be like proof of them working or any testing or really anything like that. So it's, it's, it's a tough it's a tough thing. Not to say there can be these 25B products that can be good products, but most of them are all dependent on spray coverage and how well can you spray and cover your plant. Because if you can suffocate it with an oil, most likely you can kill it. But, you know, you don't always know what's in these bottles you're getting um, unless you actually uh, are having them tested uh, to make sure of what they're claiming is in there is in there. Because, again, there have been too many incidences now of these plant washes or even some of the 25B products where people have knowingly put pesticides in there to make them work better. Interestingly enough, so that stuff oil we just talked about, it used to be sold years ago at a very dilute rate called clean and shine. And so it was a plant cleaner and it was used, they would spray down a lot of the tropicals to wash off pesticide residues and things like that. But the rate is so low as a foiler application, it really didn't have those insecticidal properties where you need to be at like the one to 2% concentration of the product and see the insecticidal properties from it. So, it, it, it's a gamble. It's a complete gamble. You know, if you got a product that um, is not EPA registered, I would first of all have it tested uh, for any other pesticides in it. Um, because again, cannabis is too expensive of a crop to, to take a, a risk on. And then, you know, you'd want to, you know, only test a plant, have a control next to it just to make sure that you aren't going to have any phytotoxicity or other weird things happening from it. And also, does it actually work? I think what's happening a lot with these these exempt products is is when you have three or four plants and you can get such good spray coverage, the water is doing a lot for you. So I think what's happening is that people that just have a few plants or plants that are well-spaced and that are in those plants looking over every inch every day, when they spray, I think the water is actually washing a certain percentage of the pests off the plants. There was actually a study done, I think it was last year or the year before, where they looked at, um, you know, Western flower thrips. And by getting good spray water coverage, they were actually able to pretty much knock thrips back to the point of conventional insecticides they were at the same level but they were able to get in there and get spray coverage on every single leaf and really baby those plants also in some of these products they have surfactants surfactants are soaps so it's almost like you're spraying the plant too with an insecticidal soap so i think the physical action of washing plus having a surfactant in there sometimes I think that's what's providing a lot of the control not actually the active ingredient so uh, with one of my ornamental larger growing operations we actually had them order in and I'm, I don't want to get into brand names but some of the more air quote popular cannabis products and we sprayed them like we would regularly spray in a greenhouse, we didn't do, you know, that wand where you get under every leaf because the reality is, is in larger commercial growing operations, you can't do that. But we sprayed them and we actually did uh, dipping too. And we saw a lot of phyto phytotoxicity and we really didn't get the control that was claimed by the products. So, you know, we just 
the 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 commercial ornamental people and vegetable guys they're not adopting these a lot of these products because we just don't see the efficacy with it because they can't spray like the cannabis people can spray and baby each plant. So it would be interesting when you spray a brand name product, then I would spray, you know, another plant with, you know, a surfactant and then have your control and see if you see the difference. Have a control with just spraying water and see what kind of results you get. And please, please, please stop spraying with paint sprayers. I, I don't understand this trend either. Paint sprayers are not pesticide applicators they're not designed they don't have the the nozzles i think investing in a good piece of you can get the right particle size you know the 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 angled nozzles and all that kind of stuff is is really critical i don't understand why people you know have these plants with so much money and they baby them so much and then they cheap out using a, a paint sprayer to spray their plants so do you have a recommendation on that end, like an atomizer or a fogger or anything like that? I think that this is when you talk to a company that produces spray product for what are you doing? Are you a greenhouse producer? Are you a field producer? You've got to get the right equipment for what you're doing. Um, and, you know, the, the different tips, which this is really where you get into specifics on that. Um, I think DRAM is an excellent company that produces really good equipment. That's pretty much the company that most commercials, commercial growers have their products. I see DRAM equipment all the time in greenhouses. But again, depending on how you're spraying and what you're spraying and what you're doing, it can all be very different. Yeah, we buy their hoses. I've had great success with that company as well. So. Yeah, they're nice people and they're smart people. Kurt Becker, plug out to that guy. And don't bombard him with emails, you know, either necessarily. <laughs> but he is so knowledgeable on spray equipment. If you ever get the opportunity to hear Kurt talk, it is, you know, I always learn from him. And, and he is, he, he really knows his stuff and he's not a bullshitter. Oh, I'm sorry, am I allowed to swear? I just did. Sorry. You're you're all good. It's totally fine. <laughs> so you're gonna give me give me the beep over that when you go back. No, I I give all these the explicit rating just in case, so there's no like twelve okay. year old kids trying to learn how to grow cannabis. On a side note though, so I have a I have a greenhouse and we grow a variety of different crops. And this year I got uh mites, which I did not do the right thing and fully identify, but I didn't plan on treating them. I was just going to let the crop go anyway at the end of the season. So my, my question is overwintering in greenhouses. So for growers that are growing cannabis and have the ability to just open up that greenhouse in the winter and let, let it freeze or let temperatures drop down to, to lower conditions, is that a good idea? Does that even make any difference in the life cycle for a lot of these pests? It all depends on the pests. Also, do you have cement floors or do you have gravel floors where, you know, if they're gravel where they can get down lower and can be protected, which is different than a cement floor, which is going to be naked and they're going to be exposed. And also, how cold can you really get it? I will just say this. Somehow, miraculously, outside, you know, pests over winter, every winter, um, even in some of the harshest conditions. But the difference between outside and in a greenhouse is outside, you know, days get shorter, temperatures start draw dropping, and all the animals birds, you know, deer, insects, mice, all get their cue. Oh, it's winter time. We have to prepare for winter. Depending on the insect um, or mite, they all overwinter differently. Some are eggs, some are pupa, some are adult, and some can handle cooler temperatures than others. It's, it's a tough thing to do to really freeze out pests completely, especially when you're probably going to bring them right back in on your plant material in the spring anyhow. Yeah, we're, my, my concern also was that we have some straw bales in there, and I'm wondering if I'm contaminating those straw bales with these mites yeah. potentially. Is that a concern? Yeah. Uh, what are they gonna What are they gonna feed on? I mean, you, you think about mites. They're, you know, they don't have a, a hard exoskeleton like beetles to help from desiccation. You know, bring home a, a 
a bean leaf with spider mites on it, which just reminded me of spider mites in the refrigerator I forgot about. Crap, they're probably dead by now. But bring home a leaf with some spider mites on it and, you know, put it in a Petri dish and see how long those might survive. Not that long. They really are, I mean, they're hardy, but they're not hardy when they don't have good environmental protection. I think plant debris is more of a of an issue, but juice by spider mites are not going to go, oh, look, I want to live in a straw hay bale where there's no food source for me. They, they can't overwinter, just go dormant or anything like that. I don't know enough about their life cycle, honestly. I need to do a little research. Well, the two-spot spider mites, they, for outside, go into what's called diapause, and they start turning more pumpkin-y, orangish in the fall, and then they'll overwinter uh, in, in that stage. But, again, forced greenhouse, you, you don't get those conditions. And, you know, with aphids, aphids feed on one plant, but they overwinter on an alternate host. So you, this, you got to know your pest, and you got to understand its life cycle. Yeah, you bring up aphids. So having a uh, edible nursery on our property as well, we have a lot of different plants, and I always get aphids on our nasturtiums every year. And uh, I, as it was explained to me, the life cycle of an aphid, uh, part of it was that these ants will farm them as a way of uh, getting more of that uh, the sugary substance. I think you had a name for it. Honeydew. Uh, the honeydew, correct. And then I thought there was a predatory wasp that was eating the aphids, but I, I, from your uh, talk, uh, uh, I got the impression that was actually wrong when you spoke about it. Okay, parasitic wasps. Predator, it's a parasitic wasp because we kind of break down into predators and parasites, where predators tend to, you know, they're more like lace wings and ladybird beetles that eat them, where the parasites are parasites. You know, I'm sticking my egg in you and I'm going to, you know, eat you from the inside out kind of thing. So with aphids, there are many of those parasitic wasps available for sale, but you've got to get the right parasite for the right aphid pest. So you have to know what aphid you're dealing with, and then you have to see if there is a commercially available uh, parasitic wasp for it, then get it and be able to release it. So would I be better off just hosing that down? I, I did notice the wasp was landing on those things, but it never really got ahead, I guess, of my aphid population. Um, and I would put diatomaceous out, earth out as a way of helping control the ants, which is another thing I wanted to talk to you about was DE. But um, in terms of treating aphids, is just water the best option there in terms of just hosing them off the plants? Depends on what aphid species you have, because, and I mean, I'm Black, uh, normally on nasturtiums, you'll see like black bean aphids, which is not something I've, and I have heard of in cannabis yet. I mean, I don't want to say it could never be there, but you know, it, that's, that's a different thing. It, 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 it also depends on your economic threshold. You know, plants can have a low level of aphids and it's not the end of the world, especially for outdoor production um, or if you're growing nasturtiums just for their bloom, something like that. I mean, I grow nasturtiums. I let, you know, uh, aphids get on there and they don't, for my landscape, it's not a problem because there's enough predators that come in the surfeit flies um, and, you know, ladybird beetle larvae. There's enough things that feed on them. But typically in a greenhouse situation, we don't really want them in there. Um, I mean, yes, you can. It's a physical action of washing them off with water. But nasturtiums, they tend to be on the underside of the leaf, and it's harder to get water coverage. you got to you know, have an angled wand kind of to, to spray underneath on there. But in a greenhouse, you know, we typically are using more of the parasites to manage them because the parasites can fly around the greenhouse and find that one aphid that's tucked away over in the corner that you might have missed. So that's the advantage to using the parasites is they can fly around and find them. So when you mentioned <clears throat> these different plants, we talked a little about trap plants and indicator plants and maybe pollinator plants. What would, is there anything that you would, you would grow in your greenhouse if you had if you had cannabis that you think would be potentially beneficial in, in one of those aspects? Well, it depends on what I was growing in my greenhouse. Am I, what, what, am I a cannabis grower or am I, you know, an nasturtium farmer? You know, it, it, let's say you're, let's say you're a cannabis grower for the sake of the podcast. So I don't think the aphid banker plant system that's commercially available as, as of yet, we haven't 
proved really a need for that. Even though I've seen it, I don't think it's worth the potential there. There may be potential with using uh, the purple flash pepper with aureus because I've seen in outdoor cannabis production aureus feeding on spider mites naturally in that situation. So I know aureus will go to cannabis and feed on the spider mites. And the problem with aureus, which is also called the minute pirate bug, you have to have a pollen for it to complete its life cycle. And in most greenhouses, you don't have a pollen source. And so that's what this pepper program does, is you grow the peppers and it provides pollen so that the adults can have pollen, lay their eggs on those pepper plants, reproduce, and then they'll leave and then they'll go out into the crop and look for things like thrips. They'll also find things like spider mites and other pests. I've seen them even, you know, feed on uh, foliar aphids and they can help really suppress pest levels. Now, granted, I am way oversimplifying this. This is not, oh, I'm going to grow some peppers and just throw them out there. It is a commitment. You, there's, you know, a, a strict regiment on how you do this, the timing and all kinds of stuff, um, which we don't have time to cover today. But I think of any of the potential plants, banker systems, I think that's the one that might have the most potential for cannabis. But, you know, we, we need to, you know, get trials set up and, and see if it works. Have you seen anything with cover crops, with people running cover crops underneath cannabis? As a, would that be a potential uh, detriment in terms of uh, being a, a plant host for some of these pests? Are you talking about inside or outside production? Uh, you know, I've seen it in both. I've seen mostly outdoor production with cover crops, but I have seen guys running in containers, large containers or beds using cover crops as, as a living mulch. Well, outside, yeah, outside, I would be, you know, you know, they're doing it in big ag. Big ag is doing it today in lots of vegetables. You see it in landscapes and stuff. And it's basically providing, you know, food resources for other beneficials. Inside, you better know what you're doing because, again, it could become a harbor for your pests as well. And that's why you, you just can't say, oh, I'm just going to throw this plant in here because, you know, it could be an alternate host for disease. Again, an alternate host for your pests. I would be very leery about doing something like that indoors, uh, you know, in, unless you, you know, are really on top of it. Would the same be said for most mulches or even mulching with the plant leaves, the fan leaves that are dead directly off the plant? I would not want to do that because if there's spider mite eggs on there, other pests, and if they can find their way off there and, and go right back up onto the plant, that's sanitation. You always want to get rid of any diseased plant material. Do not throw it in a garbage can and let it sit in your greenhouse for a day or two. It has to be out of that facility. You've got to get it out. Okay, and I, I know that everything that you're saying is very general then a lot of the if we were to talk about specific uh, pests or specific uh, beneficial insects they require a lot more knowledge than you have time or energy to share today on this podcast but could we talk just briefly in just very general terms about some the the few major pests we talked a little about spider mites already but would you be able to cover a little bit about uh, fungus gnats yeah Fungus gnats used to be a big problem in greenhouse production, um, but now that we have uh, a steady supply of really good quality beneficial nematodes, it's not so much of an issue. Unless you're growing in, you know, some of these what I'll call artificial medias, the things like rock wool, nematodes really aren't crazy about being in that kind of environment. Um, I think it's a from my experience, it's easier to manage pests when you're growing in, you know, cocoa or, you know, what we'd call, you know, a potting mix. Um, I know for ease of growing, a lot of people are moving to these, you know, artificial medias, but it's, it's harder to manage uh, the, the pests there with the biocontrol agents because they don't really like being in that artificial environment. Now, granted, from a chemical standpoint, um, you know, it, for the states that, you know, and you got to look at your state and see what you can do and da 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 But, you know, um, BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, 
And that's the strain. And this is where I see a lot of people making mistakes. There's multiple strains of BTs, and you've got to have the strain for flies, which is Israeliensis. That can still work for um, fly larva management. It has to be ingested by the flies, but we do have resistant populations out there because it's been used so much that, you know, it may not work. Um, but it, it is something that does have to be ingested. And typically, you know, you need to really wait about a week before you're going to see results. You'll see your results on your sticky cards because you change your sticky cards every Monday and you date them. You don't leave them out for two, three, and four weeks. So when I show up, we have no idea what's going on. And you're buying good quality sticky cards from companies like BioBest has nice sticky cards. Colbert has nice sticky cards. There's some really good quality products out there. I'm seeing the cannabis growers use a lot of these. They look like um, they're folded and you peel them back. I like the the sticky cards that have paper on each side because you can peel it off one week and then the next week you can peel off the other side and move that paper back to the other side. So you can get two weeks out of one sticky card. And positioning is important depending on what pest you're trying to target. I mean, sticky cards, that's like a whole, you know, discussion in itself. But for fungus gnats, that's really critical to know what your population is. Um, and also when you get, you can get large sticky ribbons that come on rolls now and they'll, they'll string them up through the greenhouses for what's called mass trapping. And that's to remove a lot of the adults. And we do know that fungus gnat larvae do feed on uh, the roots of plants and can, can vector uh, plant diseases. So that's why managing them and really getting their numbers down is really important. Now I have a friend who took his sticky cards and put them, uh, rather than being vertical, he put, put them horizontal beneath, right beneath the canopy, and that's how he runs them in his room. Have you seen anyone else doing that as a way of catching things going up and down? Well, that's that's just catching by luck as they, you know, come up. The way uh, insects are trapped on sticky cards is by the light reflecting off of them. And so there's lots of discussion on outdoor productions, which way you position them and everything. But uh, you can do that. I still like the, the horizontal positioning um, near the soil surface that will attract them up. But again, lighting is a big part of it. So would they get more light because uh, the top side would be completely exposed to light? It'd be a flat surface, and then the bottom side would be completely shaded, I guess, uh, by catching things that are flying up, and then the other thing seeing the light on the top. Do you get know what I'm describing? It possible. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. I've seen, like, interior scapes. They cut them into narrow strips to kind of hide them in plant material. Um, but, hey, this is where you could do a trial. Do, you know some down, some up, and see what, you know, works best for you in uh, your growing facility, the way your lighting is positioned. Okay, yeah, see what you catch, sure. That would be a really easy thing to, to try, compare and check out. So that was a little bit on fungus gnats. Can we talk a little bit about root aphids, too? Just a, a quick, brief, one-minute thing on root aphids. One minute, okay. Well, this is the, the root aphid that the cannabis industry is dealing with. From what I've seen, it's also found in the ornamental industry too and has a pretty wide host range. The problem is, again, if you are on a system where you know you overhead irrigate and they can flow out the bottoms of the holes in the pots, or if you're an ebb and flood system, you just keep spreading them around through your system. And um, I had a lettuce grower that had a different species, but it's still a root aphid in um, an NFT system. And they shut it down, scrubbed everything, put it back together, started from seed again, and they were back. Because all it takes is missing one. Um, and this is what's very dangerous about bringing in plants with soil. Because... It's easy to look on leaves. It's harder to find pests in the soil. And so that's how these root aphids are spreading around is through rooted plugs. So do you have any quick recommendations for people that they could look into if they are dealing with root aphids? So if you are not in a state that prohibits botanigard or mycotrol wettable powder, 
that works extremely well. We, we know that there's science on that. There's, there's BioWorks has a sheet how to deal with root aphids using Botanigard. But unfortunately, again, certain states have disallowed it which it, it, it's very frustrating because, you know, we do have a good option out there uh, for managing them. There has been, I know some people are recommending using some of the uh, soil, dwell, the hypoaspis miles, which is now Australiolapsis. I just have not seen it really suppress enough or control root aphids. Again, there is a difference between, oh, if I put it in a Petri dish, can it snack on a newly, you know, birthed baby aphid and being able to control a pest? And people are taking what they've seen in a Petri dish on a small scale and extrapolating it to control, and, and it just doesn't work that way. Um, same thing with rove beetles. I, yeah, I do think the rove beetles do predate some on them, but I've just not seen it uh, get to the level where I would feel comfortable still with it at. And um, just, you know, we are setting up some trial work looking at nematodes. But again, if you're in a rock wool system, it's much more difficult for those nematodes to be able to hold on because nematodes are actually semi-aquatic and they need to be able to move on a water film. And they move extremely well in, you know, traditional, you know, media. Um, and in that situation, if they could come in contact with the aphid, possibly it could kill it. But we don't know yet if nematodes truly can do that. And that's something we're setting up a trial right now on. Oh, that's great. That's great. And uh, I would be remiss then if I didn't at least bring up uh, broad mites and russet mites briefly with you as well. Just so, just so I can avoid a bunch of uh, angry emails. Would you be able to touch on those too? Sure. Um, broad mites in, and I hate to keep going back to ornamentals, but you know, what we're seeing in ornamentals can affect vegetable production and cannabis. This was the worst year of broad mites I've ever seen in my life in greenhouses and ornamentals. And it, it was, it was pretty epic. I think, um, it was one particular variety of plant that cuttings were coming in from offshore I mean, it's the same way cannabis is getting it. You bring your cuttings in or even your rooted cuttings and the pest is at such a low level, it's not detectable. And you, you know, you, you pot them up or you stick your cuttings under a mist system and the level stays at a dull roar, a dull roar. And then all of a sudden you turn around and you've got a lot of deformed growth. And I think they have spread, the broad might spread from that one initial plant onto lots of other crops. So, you know, if, if you bought, you know, planted hanging baskets and brought them into your cannabis operation, there's a chance you could spread the broad mite that way because broad mite has many, many, many hosts. And it's not like where the cannabis russet mite has one host. Um, it's, it's, it's very, it's much more what we call cosmopolitan. It's around, um, in lots of different places. From my experience this year, we know we can manage broad mite with a preventative program. And that's one thing people are missing. You can't contact me when your plants are webbed over. You can't contact me when you have 10,000, you know, hemp russet mites on a leaf and expect me to be able to fix it. This is all about prevention. The second you bring a cutting in, the second you stick it, the second you pot it, I would be putting predatory mites out on these plants and assuming you're going to have the problem. If you do a preventative program, it's a lot cheaper than trying to fix a problem. And it's the same thing with the hemp russet mite, which is moving around through the industry, as we discussed before, so easily. And it is just spreading and spreading. And just assume you're going to end up with it. And so starting a preventative program early. If you go into many ornamental operations today, when they stick their cutting, they start on predatory mites right then. Their main nemesis is western flower thrips. They come every year, and it's worth the investment to treat in propagation over trying to cure it in 
finished product because when you have plants that are small and compact together, it's really easy and inexpensive to use the predatory mites. When you've got bigger, larger plants, it's much harder to treat. And the cannabis industry is being too reactive. They've got to be more pro-reactive. And as far as which species, I, it depends. Are you an outdoor grow in Oregon? Are you going in a greenhouse in, you know, Oregon? Are you growing in a warehouse in Florida? You know, you have to look at your different growing conditions, what your pest complex is to be able to get the right predatory mite for what you need to do. And then you've got to look at, is a sachet right? Is a hanging sachet right? Is a sachet on a stick right? Do you want loose product? Oh, but you know, loose product, you have problems sprinkling on the leaf. So you may need other release systems. So it, it, I don't want to make it too complicated, but this is why you need to work with somebody that knows what they're doing. And unfortunately, there's not many people that do. And, and, and that's, that's the challenge today. There's lots of people that will say they know, and I wish I could clone myself and, you know, every state could have a dozen Suzannes to work, but it just, I, I can't do that technology yet, but you got to get with somebody. I, 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 somebody sent me a thing saying, you know, that someone was recommending uh, cucumeris or spider mite control. That, no, no, no. I mean, just no. And I've seen that somebody is making that recommendations that selling biocontrol agents to growing operations. And that's not, that's, that, no, no, just it's bad recommendation. So just to kind of <laughs> summarize what we talked about today, these biocontrols really do work. They're effective, but they require a lot of knowledge. And every situation is different, every growing environment and every Every pest requires uh, very specific controls and knowledge. And so as a takeaway, I guess, for growers, what I want to say is I don't want to discourage people from using biocontrols. We've established that it's, it's fairly complicated, but there, there are resources out there. You mentioned the insectaries, and I'll put up a list of those uh, insectaries at, at, on the podcast page. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share for people, though? just in general regarding biocontrols? Yes. I think with the way regulation is going and pesticide testing is going, I, I think that the cannabis industry is going to be forced more heavily into more biocontrol um, options. I think it was Delaware. Th th there's no pesticides allowed at all on cannabis production. I'm a little nervous about California opening up next year. I actually think we're going to have shortages of biocontrol agents because even now there are some issues with being able to get product because the demand for the use of biocontrol agents in greenhouse vegetables and ornamentals is just skyrocketing. And that's due to, again, they're not really able to manage the pests with even the pesticide products they have. And, you know, fine, give the cannabis industry all these chemicals that the other guys have. They'll just develop resistance to them also. And then you're going to be right back where you started from, where you're going to have to be looking at biocontrol and some of these biorational products to be able to manage your pests. I will say that how do, why do biocontrols not work? It can be, again, wrong product. So, you know, you don't know truly what your pest is and you're releasing the wrong biocontrol agent. Um, pesticide residue, you've sprayed something on your plant that can be toxic. And just because it's an OMRI listed product, it does not mean that it is safe with biocontrol agents. You need to, you know, understand chemical interactions and then product quality. And again, it, it's getting product to you in a timely manner that's viable and, and ready to eat. And I think that's, you know, a very important part of it, too. But I've seen some of the, I call, like to call them nozzle head, some of the most ardent nozzle head people out there that would never use biocontrol are now using biocontrol because they realize they have to have this as part of their pest management program. I'm not saying pesticides are bad. I'm not saying you're not going to have to spray if you use bios. And bios are not right for every single growing situation. But for the things we know they can do, 
uh, you know, I think that there's, there's, it's, it's a really, really good tool to have as long as you use them right and understand what you're doing. And again, I can't, put, you know, big, bold font, underline flashing letters. You've got to work with somebody that knows what, what they're doing. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with somebody coming in and, you know, they want to work with you, you know, ask them what their qualifications are. How long have they been doing this? You know, what makes them qualified? Because again, I, I, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of growers, unfortunately, get bad information from people who, you know, intentions good or not, are not providing them good quality information. Yeah, and I would like to see people from outside of just the cannabis industry that are making these recommendations, people that have experience in, like you mentioned, working with larger ornamental greenhouses and in egg and things like that on the, on the entomology side. Yeah. The, the one thing I tell cannabis people all the time is, so poinsettias. Greenhouse growers don't make money off of selling poinsettias. It's basically a way to keep all their employees working through, uh, you know, the winter months and keep everything going. If a ornamental person uses a product on a poinsettia, you know it has to work and be a good product because a poinsettia grower is not going to spend two cents more for plant for a plant if it doesn't work because they can't afford to use products that do not work because there is almost no if minimal profit margin on things like poinsettias. So when you look at what poinsettia growers use, they use you know botanigard, they use root shield. Um, I've even had some of them using some of the horticultural oils. We're using predatory mites. We're using parasites. Um, now, granted, some people are still using traditional chemistries um, with a, a solid rotation program, but many of the ornamental growers are being forced out of using uh, the neonic insecticides, which th that pressure is coming from the big box retailers that are not allowing growers to use the neonic. So they are losing that whole group of chemistries to be able to use, which poinsettia growers have relied on so heavily. So they're looking at these other replacements and they're actually going into using a fair amount of, of biocontrol options. Not saying they're never spraying, but you know, these biocontrol options are working for them. And again, they don't have much wiggle room on a plant as far as pricing. Yeah, you know, I really think biocontrols are the are the future of the cannabis industry for all the reasons you mentioned. The the pesticide pesticide resistant issues, the worker safety. I think public pressure is going to come in uh, as people learn more and more about the pesticides that are being used, and uh, they they really do work, especially when we're talking about uh, the monocropping that's going on, obviously in the cannabis industry, and the fact that these large scale horticultural growers are using. Uh, biocontrols, like you mentioned, really speaks volumes because they don't have the profit margins that a lot of the people do in cannabis. They have to be really smart with their money. So like you mentioned, I, I really do think this is the future and I hope that there will be more consultants available down the road as this industry blossoms. So, Yeah, I, I think more people will get more experience under their belt. I, I just have to be really lucky. I just, I got in like, I don't want to say ground level. I got in at, you know, sub-basement level to this, you know, when biocontrol was really uncool. Nobody was interested in it. Um, and I just really was. And, you know, I, I felt this was the way the industry is going to go because of you just look at, you know, the pesticide treadmill that, you know, people get on and, and resistance issues. You're going to see more companies coming to the United States, um, bringing products in. Uh, you look at a company like Beneficial Insectary, they're based in California. They've really expanded their production. BioLine uh, in California also, they produce Persimilis. They are, as far as I'm concerned, the best producer of Persimilis hands down. Um, and you can order the Persimilis right from them um, at the insectary there and especially if you're on the west coast i mean they bottle it in the morning and you get it by next morning i mean how how can you you know beat that on that kind of product but they're working on uh, becoming more efficient at production so they have more product available you know there, there's there's more things happening um but it's just unless you're dialed into the biocontrol industry it's hard to know everything that's going on in it and unfortunately we're a very very small group 
there's just not a lot of us uh, in the biocontrol industry. So. Yeah, well, thank you again for your time today. I know you're busy, and I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. So thank you again, and I really appreciate this. And I look forward to seeing you, hopefully, at another trade show or talk in the near future. Yes, well, and thanks for helping uh, having me. And I'm going to give myself one shameless plug. Just so you know, in March, um, I am working on organizing right now a, um, we're not sure if it's going to be a half day, I'm trying to pull for a full day, um, biocontrol cannabis workshop. And it's, uh, they haven't, we haven't figured out a date yet, but it's going to be um, the early part of March and it's going to be in San Diego, it looks like. And we're still trying to get that all together. But I think that um, it's something that um, if you spend a day with me, I'm going to make your brain hurt by the time you're done. Um, and it's it's going to be a lot of information because, you know, I fire you. You've been to one of my talks. I fire information pretty fast at you. But, you know, if we're given this longer time period, we can go more in, in depth on uh, these kinds of things. No, that would be invaluable. In fact, that are there any other publicly available talks that you're going to be giving in the near future that you could you could mention? Um, I'm someone's organizing one for uh, Florida, but you know, the Florida market for cannabis is so, so small um, that that's not, you know, not going to have a lot of, you know, necessary draw for that. But I do, you know, I, I will say that I'm having more cannabis people show up at my ornamental workshops and other other uh, classes um, because you can take you know biology information and sanitation information and it does transfer over um, I do try really hard to keep up with the calendar on my website on bug lady consulting I think I have a link it's you know where's the bug lady and you can go up there and see um, things that are coming in the future um, I'm going to be speaking up in Boston I can't remember uh, next month or the end of this month, actually, I think, on pesticide compatibility and biocontrol information. And I'm also working on putting together for Cultivate, which is the biggest greenhouse trade show um, in the U.S. That's going to be in July. The Saturday of that show, I'm putting together an entire day a workshop focusing on biocontrol and focusing uh, a lot on insect identification and things like that. So um, I do teach stuff all over. You know, like you said, I've, I've spoken at Canacon. Um, I've done some workshops out in Oregon. I've been in I, I'm just all over the place. So. Well, great. I'll definitely put links to all of that on the podcast page so people can find the link to your events and that that one in san diego sounds amazing so maybe i will try and make it down for that as well yeah and we're deciding right now about how much we're going to do because if we want to do any kind of hands-on stuff we're probably going to have to limit the uh number of attendees because when it gets so big it's really hard to do any kind of hands-on anything so you know as it as it progresses um you know, but we'll have more information. We just had our first call about it the other day. Great. Well, I look forward to staying in touch and seeing what exciting stuff you're learning and working on. And uh, thank you again for your time today. Oh, you're very welcome. And thanks for having me. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. That was Suzanne Wainwright Evans, also known as the Bug Lady. Her website is www.bugladyconsulting.com. I posted the links and information we discussed in this podcast right on the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the podcast menu on the top of the screen. And don't forget to sign up on our website homepage so you can stay up to date with all the latest information and podcasts right when they come out. I'm working on a few really exciting projects so you'll want to be on that email list. There are a few new products I'm going to be announcing soon that could dramatically reduce your labor costs and improve plant growth. I wanted to let everyone know that I will be pausing the podcast schedule for the month of December as it's just too busy with the holidays, but we will be back up in 2018 with more amazing guests. I'm also tossing around the idea of doing a listener content email episode where I would answer any questions you may have regarding cultivation and soil. So send me an email at tad at kisorganics.com. That's T-A-D at kisorganics.com or anything through our website contact page. This is a great opportunity to fill in the gaps between all of the speakers and information that's been shared already. I look forward to hearing from people. 
I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season and stay tuned for more cannabis cultivation and science podcasts in the new year.